Welcome to a CNBC Africa special, a captain of industry at that. And today we're speaking to the managing director of Gada World. To many, you may not have heard of Gada World. To those on uh, some parts of this continent, you may have heard of their expansion plans. Now we're going to dive into that. And uh, effects of the pandemic, of course, as always, I'm Arnold Quizera coming to you here from Kigali. Randa, you can tweet us at CNBC Africa. You could tag me directly at The Real Quizera. Now, my guest today is the managing director of Gada World's operations in East Africa. And he could correct me if I'm wrong there. But he also goes by the name Arnold, Nicholas Arnold, at that. Thank you for making the time and thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Nice to meet you. Pleasure is all mine. Um, quickly, um, pandemic, uh, before we dive into the real reason as to why you're here, um, the pandemic has had its effects uh, on the global security uh, industry. Uh, what are some of those challenges that you have picked and that have affected the industry? Well, so, I mean, look, I think when you think about the fact that the majority of the services that we provide are manpower based, okay, we have over 30,000 people in the region. And um, so we had to act very quickly in order to make sure that without a, uh, a substantial testing protocol and regime, we had to put in place some very strong sort of um, safety protocols to protect our staff and to have early warning signals in the event of any of the symptoms coming to the fore of any of our staff that we have a contact tracing program and a protocol that follows that. Now, I mean, all through last year, most of, most of the cases that we did have, that we, we did identify through testing, um, most of them were asymptomatic. And we've had very few symptomatic cases and, it's, and therefore it makes it very difficult to detect. So uh, that means that certainly during lockdown in all of the countries we we're operating in, we had to go to a split shift system in the offices and we had to you know, maintain social distancing. We um, used a combination of disposable and reusable masks. Um, we did start using gloves, but we have people that work front of, let's say front of house on many of our assignments, like you see today down at the hotel. You can't have people wearing gloves all the time who are within one meter of, of, of guests or customers and clients. And so we've, you know, we adapted and we, uh, you know, we evolved in terms of our protocols to try and keep our people as safe as possible. Um, and, and, and really, uh, it's a testament to those policies and procedures that we've kept our people as safe as we possibly can. We've had, you know, a number of cases across the board, but it's not more than 100 out of 30,000 staff that have known cases, so to speak. Um, some have had to be admitted to hospital. Um, and have received treatment and have recovered and gone back to work. So I, I think largely we've, you know, we've, we've fared quite well in an African context, I, I would say. I mean, from a business perspective, um, we, we did suffer um, because of the economic impact associated with the COVID and the lockdown that uh, was attached to it. But by the same token, we also gained as well um, because we started to put in place checks and balances, temperature checks, sanitization programs, some technology to assist um, companies to stay open and maintain you know, uh, an operating capability. I think the other thing that's really helped us in Africa is that um, we were classified as part of essential services. So the government enabled us to conduct our operations which are always 24-7. Uh, Arnold, you mentioned um, the, you know, the effects on your businesses. Uh, our viewers would be very interested in knowing uh, how big of a hit did things like your revenues take? Yeah, so I mean, uh, that's, what I'm, uh, that's the point I'm trying to make is that we, we, we did lose uh, business, but we compensated, it for, uh, compensated for it in different ways. Um, so we innovated, we brought technology to the, to, the, to the fore because we had a lot more people working from home and therefore residential security became quite important. Um, but yes, we did have price pressure uh, that did impact us in terms of our performance. But actually, we became much more resilient and much stronger and uh, introduced additional service lines which we probably would not have been as proactive to you know, uh, introduce or implement, which have now basically been rolled out as part of our mainstream offering. Um, running a security company is quite different from you know, what we'll term as traditional industries, right? It's very secretive. 
uh, that being one thing. Uh, uh, but what is different? W what key component there is that is different from running Gada World to someone running Hotel ABCD? So, I mean, when you get up to my level, it's, it's about running a business. So it's, around, it's about running a P&L. But obviously with our industry and our business, we're manpower focused. So it's about cost. It's about cost management and it's about how you establish a culture amongst 30,000 people. Because I can't touch 30,000 people, but we have teams in place that can. And as long as our integrity and our, you know, our values are, are adhered to or that, that, that culture is basically built into our staff, that's what's key for me in terms of trying to deliver success with our customers and our, and our clients. So actually, I don't see it being very different at all. Yes, it's manpower heavy and we introduce other service lines too. But at the end of the day, it's a sales function at the front end. It's about customer relationships. It's about retention. And ultimately, it's about innovation and client stickiness. And um, there's no secretive activity associated with what we do. We look after hotels and banks and embassies and you see us in a very overt capacity and way. And because of that, we fulfill a very important function. And therefore, we have to work very closely and in partnership with government and other key stakeholder agencies like um, you know, uh, private security uh, associations, international bodies like o ICOCA um, and VPSHR uh, and complying with that and, and, and recruiting ethically and training people professionally, equipping them to be able to do their jobs. So uh, I don't see it as being very different at all. Um, uh, what I'm picking from that is very similar to the insurance sector. Everyone, no one wants to pay for it, but everyone needs it. Yes, yes, and you're spot on there. And it's a tough, uh, that, that is a very tough dynamic that we have to contend with, um, especially when a market is not regulated. Now, Rwanda is about to go through a very regulated environment in the security sector, which I f absolutely embrace, because then it separates out um, the, let the bluffers, from the real deliverers. And there, you can then compete on tenders properly and effectively. But for sure, it's about client stickiness. It's about differentiation. How do we make ourselves different to our competition so that we are able to generate more revenue from our guards that we supply on a day-to-day -day basis? And it's about how do we enhance that offering to improve that margin because of the competitive competitiveness around um, around guard. So we want to sell the value proposition than just a guard on the gate that you would have at your residence or at the hotel. Uh, I'm going to come back to that competitive uh, conversation a little bit later on. I just want us to take a few steps back. 2016, right? Um, acquisition of KK Security in Rwanda. What are the lessons you picked from that that has led us here? So actually, we've been on a, a really interesting African journey of, of acquisitions. And yes, um, KK Security was the first. And one of the reasons why we chose KK Security, because when we did our due diligence on the company, they, they came out very well uh, in terms of integrity and ethics and how they've managed their accounts and their payables and the receivables and uh, suppliers and, and, and how they recruit and pay their guards. Um, and, and, that, and that for us was very important. And it made the discussion and the engagement very easy for us. Now, you might ask why KK Security? Well, actually, they're the, outside of South Africa, they were the, they, they were the second biggest company to G4S operating on the continent. There are a lot of very big companies operating in one country or maybe two countries, but that's it. So what KK afforded us was a regional presence with a hub in Nairobi, which included Rwanda, which for us was very exciting. And of course, that five-year journey that we've been on has now manifested in where we are today and being able to rebrand to Garda World. So we look for a, a, you know, a signature event that we can use to celebrate the rebranding from an old company brand to the Garda World brand. And uh, the acquisition of Adjust Pro um, and the combination of those two businesses in a market like this made it absolutely perfect for us to rebrand. So we've acquired other businesses. It forms a very important part of our growth strategy for Africa um, because of the high cost of capex and infrastructure, um, which we have to take uh, cognizance of. And if, being entrepreneurial growth, you know, uh, uh, being an entrepreneurial growth business, we, need, we, we can't afford to wait. 
So we want to do both. It's a parallel strategy. And, um, and that's why now we are number two in the marketplace here and, 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 wa and, and want to continue that growth. Um, what is the biggest component? Uh, if someone is to think of Gadawal, right, uh, what it provides, what do you think is that sector or department within the security sphere that is your biggest strength? Well, I mean, uh, we are a guarding business. We are a staffing business. But what we like to do is bolt on additional services to provide a customer what he needs because a guarding or manpower driven solution is not going to give a customer everything that they need. If it's a factory, for example, that's making beer, there's a fire risk, there's a medical risk, there is a th threat of counterfeiting, of fiduciary risk, of insurance risk. Um, you know, you might be dealing with high net worth individuals. So what, what we like to, to do is listen to our customers and, and, and essentially design a solution for them. And if it's a product or a service that we can't bring to the table um, in-house, then we would look to bring it from within the Garda World family to support, be that from Nairobi or be that from, you know, the US or Canada. Uh, trust is a key component in the industry. Uh, and you've mentioned competition and compliance or the lack of it in some parts uh, of the continent when it comes to uh, how the industry is, um, is managed as a whole. Um, how are you able to build trust while staying competitive? Yeah, so I think that's a really good point. So one of the things we try and do with our customers, and that's why tender processes often stifle innovation in that regard. And we try to get past the tender process so we can discuss things like that. How do you gain trust as a supplier to a customer? And also, how do we gain trust from our staff to be able to do the right thing? And that's really important. And actually today, when we did our event at the school next door um, to our head office, we, award, we gave out what are called Garda World Values Awards. And these are awards that I have introduced across the region, um, which we give out every month to select individuals who have gone above and beyond their normal duties. They may have prevented a, th a significant theft. They may have put out a fire. They may have saved somebody's life. They may have prevented an attack of some sort or another. It is that which we need to recognize and, and value um, in a public way uh, and, and also in, in some support. And actually some of our customers contribute and get involved in this as well. And it's what helps us build that trust. And the customer sees us as a real partner when we do things like that because we're giving back to our staff, recognizing their efforts, and, and it works uh, you know, hand in hand with our, our clients. And that's how we build trust. And I think the other piece that's really important around this is responsiveness. Because we accept we've got a huge human capital and mistakes do get made. And we do have challenges from time to time. The key for me and for all of my staff is I always say, I don't ever want to come to one of my countries and have a client say you didn't respond fast enough. It might be just a phone call. It may be an email. It may be just to say, there's been a challenge. We're on the case. We'll fix it. It's a camera not working. It's, it's a person who didn't turn up for duty. A replacement is, is that's how you build trust. And, and in my view, you can, uh, you, you, you can dilute that competitiveness just purely based on how you build trust with your customers. Uh, and I'd say to the group of people that needs you know, the trust, uh, part of your staff, uh, you know, the guards, as you've mentioned, and more often than not, we've seen these stories come up, uh, not specifically with uh, Gada World or any of uh, the companies you've brought up, but it's a challenge in the industry, and that's remuneration, you know, how much are they paid? Now, you've already told us that you have a standard by which a certain level of education you have, and usually, uh, and this from a moral perspective, uh, these are people who at times are seen as at the end of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that, one, these people are well taken care of, two, uh, that they are respected while they're doing their work? Yeah, so uh, the first thing I would, I would say is um, we don't like calling our staff guards, number one. They're security officers. They've undergone a level of training, they have a certificate, and we, and we respect them for that. And we try and cultivate that that, that teamwork, that team ethic amongst them, right? Of course, at the end of the day, it's about the money. The money is key for these guys. Now, in countries where there's no set minimum wage, 
Okay, we have to work with the market forces and what we try and do is work with our customers to try and align with them and ensure that we pay them a fair wage that's reasonable for them to be able to do their jobs and fundamentally so that they don't do a second or a third job or that they get enticed to do something that they wouldn't normally do. And I think that's, that's what's really important. So if we can work with a customer to offer a bonus, you know, or an allowance, transport or medical or something that improves the, their situation which incentivizes them to do more and better that's that's a win-win situation for us um let's jump out of that we're running out of time just have two more questions uh for you uh one i want us to go back to the rebranding and but more specifically the timing of the rebranding mm -hmm. um why now well, that's an interesting question. Actually, it would have been done earlier this year, but obviously because of COVID and you know, further lockdowns, it delayed us. We were going to do it in sort of, I think, March, April time. Um, but you know, we've managed to do it now, which is, which is great. And, and it's come off the back of it's basically concluding all of the activities around the acquisition. And we're, you know, we're not quite halfway through the year, and we wanted to give ourselves the opportunity as Garda World, the best possible chance to, to, to grow as a new, as a new brand, a new company. Uh, another thing is investment in the sector. Again, one of the things people are quite tight-lipped about. Uh, how much does it take into, and here you know, you're speaking to a young entrepreneur, a young person who's interested in starting their own security company out there. What does it take to build this from, from the ground up? Yeah, it's, it's a substantial investment and, uh, in, in infrastructure, and I alluded to that earlier, which is why we do often have an, uh, an, uh, an inorganic M&A play associated with our growth strategy, because if we're providing alarm response, you need vehicles, you need a control room, you need controllers to be able to monitor and respond. Um, guarding and providing of security officers into uh, a, a place like Kigali, for example, you require a supervisory overlay. You need technology to supervise, to ensure people turn up on time, that people you know, do, do their jobs and that they actually are there and they check and, and they, they open, you know, they're going around doing their patrol routine. This, the, this is a barrier to entry and there's no doubt about it. If you're gonna do it seriously, you, if you want to do it seriously, you need an HR function, you need a finance function, you need lots of supporting functions to ensure that that security officer is in his best possible condition to deliver his service. Doesn't that bring about the risk of, you know, monopolies uh, running uh, the industry? Not necessarily, um, because the, if you look at most of the markets, especially in Africa, the security sectors are huge in terms of manpower. So I, I, don't, I don't think so. There are certain clients who will expect companies to have standards, expect companies to be training their staff well and have um, a good professional ethos and, and culture um, and infrastructure to look after those staff to be able to deliver their job and their services to the best of their ability. So that might be diplomatic. That might be a remote site, you know, looking after a farm or a mine uh, or a power project. And that may not be everybody's cup of tea if you know what I mean. Get you. And of those that you've mentioned, what do you think is the biggest challenge uh, in, in terms of what's provided to your clientele and customers uh, and running off that business? What is the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is, is, is really just staying on top of, of your staff, is making sure service delivery is at the forefront of everybody's minds, that customer relationships are, are maintained, and that in the end, when there is a challenge, a request or a complaint, it's dealt with as fast as possible. And so inside your organization, as you grow, you need to make sure you've got robust policies, procedures, communications, such that um, something that happens at six o'clock tomorrow morning is reported into the control room and is fed up the chain to management so that they can deal with that response as quickly as possible. Because that's how you retain customers. That's how you grow your customers as well. Um, and I think that's the key. It, and, and, and it may sound quite simple in terms of my answer to you now, but actually in practice, 
if you don't have robust policies and procedures and training and staff and teams to look after that customer, it can, it can unravel very quickly. Uh, when you look at uh, the future of the industry, right, um, do you ever envision it being the kind of industry that, you know, a company like Gada World listing on the Nairobi Securities Exchange or Rwanda Stock Exchange or Uganda Stock Exchange? I mean, that's an, that is an interesting question. And I think that, that uh, at the moment, I would say no. But as the continent evolves in terms of its local content and local ownership, um, its drive to, to, to have locals in, investing in and being part of you know, multinationals who have got a presence in countries, and it's not specific to security, it could be manufacturing, it could be industrial, it could be whatever, there could be a play in the future where listing on the stock exchange to raise equity to fund an M&A program in a country like Kenya or uh, Tanzania may become something that's a reality. But it's, it's not on the radar at the moment. Um, and uh, let's see. It's an evolution, I think. Uh, okay, giving some hope to some of our investors. Absolutely. And, and uh, when you look at uh, you know, the coming of cryptos into the business world, uh, industry keeps evolving, more investment in R&D and the likes. Um, where is the future headed if we have to look five years, five to ten years from now of the security industry? So I think it's, um, it's an upskilling of the workforce and embracing technology. Do you think the current core business models will be running then? Uh, no. Uh, I think, uh, or to a much lesser degree. So if our business model is 80% manpower driven right now, I would see that changing significantly. And so you have better quality people providing security services for high value or, you know, um, you know let's say pe providing mobile response to a technology alert or alarm that's smart and has analytics attached to it. So it supports data and it helps a customer basically become more efficient and more profitable at the end of the day. So I think that there is definitely uh, an evolution you know, underway and it will be interesting to see which countries evolve faster than others because they will be the market leaders in my view. And this industry itself may evolve. Oh, without a doubt. It is already evolving. Um, and and, and, and just, take, uh, just take manpower solutions, uh, for example. It's no longer about providing security officers. It could be around providing, you know, um, uh, staffing solutions, front of house receptionists, drivers, cleaners, you know, pest control uh, specialists. Um, so there's many different angles that one can take in, in that space uh, because they're still going to be required, in my view. Unfortunately, this conversation has to come to an end, Arnold. Thank you for making the time. It's a pleasure. Hope you enjoy the rest of your stay in Kigali. Uh, Nicholas Arnold, he's the managing director of Gada World East Africa. As always, if you want to be part of this conversation, tweet us at CNBC Africa. You could tag me at The Real Quizera. Have a great rest of your day.